Fellowship family, welcome. Uh, it is so good to have you with us today. My name is Michael. I'm a pastor here, and this is my wife again. Faith, I'm here again. You're here again. <laughs> you did so good last week. We brought you back. Thank uh, you. We're so glad to be together. We just want to take a special moment to say, if you're new and this is your first time joining us, or first or second time, we just want to say thanks for being with us. Uh, we love having you here. If you've been rolling with us for a very long time, we also want to say thank you for being here. It's going to be a great time together today. Yes, and we say this every week. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we exist to make disciples. That's right, and we have some church updates coming at you. This, this is some exciting stuff. Yes. So if you're local, if you're in the area, we just want you to know starting August 1st, starting next weekend, we will be gathering in person at Monrovia High School on a weekly basis. So excited to it, be with you guys again. It's time. It's yeah. time to meet together weekly. We are so excited about it. We have a, we have a sermon series coming up called Entrusted, and mm -hmm. it's all about what God has entrusted us with and how we steward that. I think as all of us are in this season of transitioning from stay at home and pandemic to things opening up a bit, it's gonna be a timely series for us to talk about what it looks like for us to steward all God has entrusted us with. So we really wanna see you there. Uh, we won't have capacity limits in the auditorium so you can come and know that there's gonna be a seat for you. And we also have some really exciting things for, for some of our kiddos. That's What's going right. on in August? So we have Camp Sunday. Yes. And this is Yes, we are so excited about this. The kids are gonna get together and be together. It's gonna be so much fun. It's um, kindergarten through fifth grade. That's right. And we really need you to register. So you can go online to do that. Um, you won't wanna miss it. And it's a it's a great time to invite your neighbor yep. um, or your kid's best friend. Yeah, Yeah. So that's right. Yeah, yeah that's gonna be such a great time for our kids. Our kids ministry is insane and they're gonna do an amazing job with that. Um, and then we just wanna shout out everybody who is either not gonna be able to, if you live in the area and you can't make it next Sunday, and you're still going to be in your PJs with your coffee at home, <laughs> we just want to say we love you. And we're going to continue our, our at-home services and we're going to continue to worship together in this way. If you don't live in the region and you can't get on a flight and come to our in-person service, we just want to say we see you and we're going to continue to worship fellowship at home on a weekly basis. We're not going anywhere. And um, yeah, we just want to say that to you, show you love. We love you so much. And when in doubt, when you need to know what's going on in the life of our church, you can go to madeforfellowship.com slash upcoming. That's right. Uh, that's all we have for church updates. We're so excited to worship together. The summer speaker series has been insane. It's been so good. Been this so is our good. last week of it, so it's going to end with a bang. We know it is. Uh, but before we get to that, we just want to worship together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our favorite part of any service that we're a part of is just worship. And so wherever you find yourself, however you're engaging, prepare your heart, prepare your mind um, just to engage with God right now and let his Holy Spirit speak to you wherever you're at and just enjoy being in his presence. Fellowship, let's worship together. Yes, we do. Yes, we love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim.
power in your name. Yes, there is Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there's power in your name. That there is power when we call. When we call on your name, Jesus. Oh, there's power in your name. Oh, and things change. Things change when we call you, Jesus. Things change when we call your name. Things change when I call you, Jesus.
Hello friends, my name is Angela Lee um, and it is a delight to be with you all today. Uh, we are rounding out our summer speaker series and I don't know about you, but it has been so good for my soul. Um, this has been such a summer of sweet encouragement um, as I've journeyed through this Sabbath season with the Lord and I pray that it's been the same for you. A lot of what we're actually gonna be hearing uh, today, this summer has inspired. And so I believe that what the Lord has to say to all of us today are words that are inspired um, by God above. And I pray um, that it would be nourishment for your soul as well. Um, I pray that God would speak to you today and it would seal in your heart the work that's been done over these last few months. Uh, let's jump in. Uh, so I grew up in the Black Baptist Church in the South. Um, and so where the pews were red with velvet material and the hymnals were wrapped in red leather and embossed with gold lettering, everything pointed to refinement, to dignity. Everything was in place, perfectly in order, clean and neat. It was a place where harmonies were learned in the choir stand and in the congregation pew. It was a sanctuary. It was a holy place. It wasn't regular. And as a kid, I really, I couldn't appreciate it. I thought it was actually annoying that we couldn't, you know, step on the altar, that we couldn't eat during that four hour long service, but it was a holy place. And through both the spoken and unspoken things, we were being taught not only about how to behave in a holy space of worship, but about the object of our worship. And every so often, on the perfect musical rotation that I never really quite understood, but somehow found comfort in the predictability of those chord progressions, they would start singing a song that everyone knew and just joined in with. One of my favorites, even to this day, sounded a little something like this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heaven 
chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. The word of the Lord says this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become our high priest forever. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Today during our time, we're going to be talking about blessed assurance. Jesus, we thank you so much for this time, for this space. God, to op this opportunity to worship you by listening to and sitting underneath your spoken word. God, I pray that this time would transform us from the inside out, that your Holy Spirit would speak in and through every single moment. God, would you go before us, prepare the way, prepare our hearts. Our hearts and our minds are listening to you now, Lord. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your mighty and matchless name we pray these things. Amen. If you'll indulge me for a little while, I believe that there are three things that the Lord would have us know and understand about this blessed assurance that we have in Christ Jesus. The first one is, is that blessed assurance is found in unshakable love. The second is that blessed assurance is found in mundane spaces. And blessed assurance is found in community. Let's start with the first one. Blessed assurance is found in unshakable love. For a little bit of context historically here, the unknown writer of the book of Hebrews in this passage is writing to a group of Jewish believers, people who had already professed a faith in Christ, but were also well versed in the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah. This letter was written to friends who claimed to know Christ, but who were already retreating spiritually and falling into a deadly routine of wandering away from the faith. In previous verses, the writer actually commended their past actions and called them to imitate those who through faith and patience will inherit what is promised by God. This writer, who we don't know who it is, encouraged them and, and now us to hold fast to our faith. But why and how? How can we hold on to our faith? How can we hold on to this blessed assurance? I believe that the first way is through realizing that it's found in us clinging to an unshakable love. There's a show uh, that my husband and I like to watch with our 11 year old. It's called Lego Masters. And the premise of this show is basically to prove who's the best at building these incredible works of art using, you guessed it, Legos. 
And y'all, there are some unreal things that these builders make with Legos. Uh, well, there was this one episode that we watched where the Lego brick builders had to build a skyscraper of four feet tall that could withstand up to 11 points on the Richter scale. And they had this table and everything that could simulate the shake and all of that. And it was amazing because these Lego builders who compete professionally were building these towers that were thick and solid and wide at the bases and really thin at the tops. These sweeping skyscrapers. All of these builders thinking, if I make it heavy enough, if I make it sturdy enough according to what I think strength is, it will stand. But do you know which tower actually could withstand the greatest level of shock? To my surprise, it was the tower that had the lightest load. See, there were these engineers who were also competing in this show, and, and what they said was that because it was a light load, a lightly held structure, that there was less density to be shaken and therefore had a greater chance for the tower to stand. And it did. The tower stood up to and through the highest level of tension and shaking that the judges could give it. The light load could withstand the shaking. And I believe that that same principle applies to us. You see, my friends, Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But how do we live a life where our burden is light in a world where everything just piles burden on burden upon us? So that when life comes to shake us up, we can actually withstand the distress. I'd like to present to you today that I believe it's by living in unshakable love. See, living in unshakable love means that when life happens to me, it's not about how well I handle the situation, but about how quickly I'm willing to lay it down. How quickly I'm willing to get it off my shoulders, confess it out of my heart and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Surrendering and trusting that God loves me enough to take these burdens Friends, that's the first step. And see, I already know, I lost some of you by saying that word, surrender. See, we live in a cultural moment where accomplishment and ability are praised. They are actually seen as the highest esteem that you can gain for yourself. And I'm going to tell on myself here, I thrive when people say to me, oh, Angela, you have such a high capacity. Those words are like a drug for me. Why? Why am I like that? That's usually the question during my therapy sessions. <laughs> but then the other question is, why are you like that? Because I know I'm not the only one. Friends, it's because we have been socialized to believe that being able to carry everything on our own shoulders and in our own might is actually the highest praise that we could achieve. It is a badge of honor. The enemy has done an impeccable job teaching us to center ourselves in every narrative of our lives. You're the best mom. You're the best friend. You're the greatest student. You're the highest performer. You, 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 you. But do you know where that leads us? Do you know what fanning the flame of your own greatness gets you? Burnt out. That's what it gets you. It's a high, clash, high flash and a quick burn to a five alarm fire that will burn you right to the end of yourself. I don't know if you know this or not, but we as humans are limited. We are and we have limited resources. We in and of ourselves are a limited resource in our humanity. It's actually the one thing that we can be sure of. And then it begs the question, where did we learn that we needed to be all those things? Where did we get all those expectations from? Where did those worries, thoughts, and concerns come from? Why did we pick those up in the first place? And how did we get to the place where those are now embedded in our beliefs and, dr beliefs and driving our actions? Because let me tell you, it's not in these 66 books. That's not what we find in here especially in the book of Hebrews. We see throughout the entire book, the writer is actually making the point that Jesus is a trustworthy source of all we need. Above and beyond anything that we can try to achieve or try to build for ourselves, Jesus is superior to angels, to Moses and priests, that the rest that we'll actually find in Christ and in heaven is greater than even earthly Sabbath. 
we find a love letter written to beloved children being invited into a love that surpasses all understanding and human comprehension. We find the writer making a case that there is hope in the complete trustworthiness of God's word. And we can find God's promises, hope and encouragement to help us carry on. We find in this book a love that we can cling to and find our rest in. So now I'm gonna go back to that word that I used earlier, surrender. See, to surrender would mean I give up my way, my thoughts, my deeds, my accomplishments, my everything. Culture would say that that's weak, but in Christ, biblically speaking, that makes me strong. The psalm that you heard earlier says, perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my savior am happy and blessed. Surrender says that I am no longer the center of the narrative, that Christ is the center of everything. Surrender in the dictionary is defined as to be able to give up or agree to forego something, especially in favor of another something. So let's, let's spell this out. Let's just make it plain. 2,000 years ago, a man without sin named Jesus endured the punishment of the cross so that we, God's children, could be reconciled back to our creator to once again be in perfect relationship. And what held Jesus on that cross there were not the nails in his hands or the crown on his head. It was an undeniable, unmatched, unrivaled, never-ending, veil-tearing, sin-destroying love a love that wasn't stopped by death in the grave, but that rose in all power and victory on the third day. Hallelujah. That love, my friends, that love is trustworthy. In a world where everything has filters and conditions and expectations on them, this love was given freely. This love is safe enough to surrender our entire lives to. This love can birth in us an undeniable hope. A hope that there is a God in heaven with a greater plan, a greater purpose, and a greater way than anything we could achieve or build on our own. You see, retaining this hope demands strong action, but not strong according to earthly standards, according to a life laid down and surrendered in exchange for God's promises. And this is why we can surrender and completely give up our way in favor of God's way. This is really, this is where we should flee to Christ for security and protection from the uncertainty of this world. When we are able to surrender, accept, and live in this unshakable love, we are then actually able to turn around and live like we are loved. We're able to see our neighbor through a lens of unconditional love and not condition and bias. We're able to see injustice and all of its manifestations and how those grieve the heart of God. We're able to see forgiveness as something that heals us and doesn't rely on the other person. We're able to see generational wounds and curses and say, no more, this stops with me. We're able to live from a place where we can participate in the work that God is doing in the earth. We're able to look inward and begin the healing process and unlearning process of living and earning love simply by living and being because we are loved. What is standing in the way of you holding fast to unshakable love? What is stopping you from believing that you are worthy of this unshakable love? Blessed assurance is found in unshakable love. And also, blessed assurance is found in the mundane places. I served as a youth pastor uh, for the early years of my time in ministry. It was such a sweet time. Some of the best times that were always retreats and camps. They're, they're so much fun and there's so much life change that happens in those spaces. Um, and there's always cry night. That cry night becomes infamous uh, for being the space where there's an altar call is being made. Kids are coming to the front. They're giving their lives to Jesus. And you guessed it, they cry a lot. 
and it's so beautiful and it's so powerful and I get weepy thinking about it. And I was always a puddle of tears watching my students cry out to God and, and submit their lives to the Lordship of Jesus. But then I, then I noticed something. Camp after camp, sometimes the same kids would be at the altar again, giving their lives to Jesus, having another cry experience. And it made me wonder like, what's happening here? Did it not stick the first time? But then after a little reflection, I noticed this in my own life too. I, I used to feel like, like this leading up to a big worship night, especially like, oh yeah, now my cup is gonna be full for sure and I'm gonna have the strength to carry on in Jesus. And all that is great and all that is wonderful. Don't get me wrong, I love a good worship night. It just begs the question, why is it that it's only in these mountaintop moments where those are the places where my faith is strengthened? Why is it that my students only felt like they were meeting Jesus during cry night of camp? Is it possible that we've been taught that the Holy Spirit only shows up in these big sweeping moments where the song Oceans is in crescendo of the bridge and we're all weepy? Again, don't get me wrong. Those moments matter and they're beautiful and they're wonderful and they're a sweet time to be overwhelmed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But what if, what if the Lord wanted us to shore up our anchor and find our blessed assurance in the mundane, everyday spaces? I grew up Pentecostal, um, so I was discipled a lot around like emotional experiences with God. I was taught that you needed to be in your prayer closet, on your face before the Lord, up early in the morning, reading the word of God daily. And if those are part of your walk with Jesus, keep doing that. Those are really good and beautiful, wonderful things. But then for me, I had my first baby and my days ran together, night and day were all mixed up, time was relative and all of the sudden, the normal ways that I had of connecting with God were just gone. And I felt so far from God. And parenthetically, in a season that's already as isolating as the fourth trimester or the three months postpartum, it was a really rough place to be in. Until one day, I was in our glider with a sleeping baby in my arms, and I heard the voice of God say to me, look at her face. That's my image. You're spending time with me right now. I'm not far. When you change her diaper, you're caring for the least of these and worshiping me. When you're up in the middle of the night, you're being faithful to the season that I've called you to, and it pleases my heart. Right there, in the middle of the night, with milk stains on my shirt and messy hair, I was communing with God. Right there, in that moment, God was reshaping and reforming everything I thought about, what it meant to shore up my foundation of faith, just by being still, just by being available. Simply in that mundane space, I met God. Where are the mundane spaces in your life? Maybe you're a single person and the mundane space is the time when you lay down in bed and the enemy tries to remind you again of your loneliness. Maybe that's where God wants to meet you and combat the lies. Or maybe you're someone with an intense commute to work and your mundane space is in your car wedged between other cars on the freeway. Or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and your mundane space is in changing diapers and picking up toys. Maybe you're a teenager and your mundane space is on your couch during your summer break and while you're bored at home. Did you know, my friend, God wants to meet you right there? Did you know that God cares about those seemingly insignificant spaces of your life? Did you know that in those still moments, in those seemingly silent moments, God has something to say. There's someone in the Bible who knew about those mundane spaces and we meet him in the book of Exodus. Young Moses. In Exodus 2, we see someone who was met at a crossroads in his life where the cultural realities within him actually collided with the spiritual and emotional tensions that he felt internally. If you've never read the Bible, let me summarize the story for you. Young Moses sees a Hebrew slave being beaten. He kills the slave driver, beating the Hebrew, flees from Egypt to escape punishment. And in the midst of the swirling around him, God takes him to a quiet place in the desert. 
a place where he becomes a shepherd. He gets married. He becomes a dad. He has a son. But God's not done with him yet. According to Acts 7, Moses was in the desert tending flock for 40 years. 40 years of seemingly mundane space. 40 years of seemingly unimportant routine space and time. But what was God doing in that mundane space? God knew who Moses needed to be in those 40 years. And God knew what it would take to get him there along the way. To refine Moses from a murderer to a deliverer, from someone who wreaks havoc to a peacemaker, from someone struggling in his ethnic identity to a reconciler, from an overzealous and unfocused activist to a master diplomat, from someone spiritually homeless to building a home and a family and a life. God needed to take the things that were already in Moses and nurture them through time and focused energy in a space away that seemed unimportant. God knew that living in the desert space would turn down the noise in Moses' heart and turn down the distraction to help refocus and reorient this young man. God used the mundane things like shepherding, like parenting. He used the repetitive things. He used the silent things to slowly but surely orient Moses' heart towards God so that when God finally spoke in chapter 3, verses 2, Moses' ear was uniquely tuned to the voice of Yahweh. So that when he came to Moses in a burning bush, Moses didn't flee, but the burning intensity of the presence of God was only an invitation to the deeper, bigger calling. Where are the spaces in your life where the Holy Spirit wants to meet you, to secure the anchor for your soul, but you're too distracted to pay attention? Where are things too loud for you to hear the voice of God? Where do the things in your life feel insecure because you've actually untethered yourself from the heart of God? Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Pay attention to, draw your focus to the fact that I am God. Then Psalm 139.23 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. As I think about these two scriptures swirling together, uh, it brings to me the, the, the imagery of when you're at an airport or when you're going to a game. For your safety and for everybody else's, they search you, right? But how does that happen? You have to be still, put your arms out and, you know, stand a little bit like this and they search you so that they can move the search wand so they can pat you down so that you can be scanned. And if everything's okay, then you just move forward. But if it's not, then usually you have to be taken aside to do a deeper search. Again, it's actually for your good, for the good of those around you. Spiritually speaking, my friends, Sometimes that searching happens at a spiritually stirring worship night. And sometimes it happens when you're on a walk around your block. Sometimes it happens when you're simply being still before the Lord. You might be listening to me today and you might feel like you're in a season where you're actually stuck, where you're actually standing still. And I would like to suggest to you today that maybe you're still because you're actually receiving the blessing of Psalm 46. And you might be thinking, well, Angela, my stillness is because I'm stuck at home with a new baby and this doesn't feel like an invitation. Or maybe you've been in a job too long or maybe you've just been single more years than you thought you'd ever be. Friend, I know, I know it doesn't feel like it. But what does it cost for you to consider that God is doing a deeper more transformative work in you while you wait? What does it cost you to find that blessed assurance in everyday moments? God is there and wants to meet you. Just listen. But there there are some seasons where that's just impossible and it feels hard. And that brings us to our third point. And that's important to remember that blessed assurance is found in community. Have you, ever, have you ever been to a physical therapist? Um, they're amazing at what they do. 
Usually people go to them after they've sustained an injury of some sort, and the physical therapist helps to rehabilitate this person back to full health, hopefully. See, sometimes people come to the physical therapist and they're in a wheelchair. Well, then the physical therapist will help that person out of their chair and walk them to whatever station they need to go to to do their exercise. As the person journeys through rehabilitation, the physical therapist will encourage their patient, remind them that they can do it, and help their patient look forward to what their body is built to do. When the patient's in pain, they can't feel the healing. And it's the PT's job to hold the hope while the patient does the hard work of the therapy. That is what healthy Christian community does for us. In verse 19, the writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Did you catch that? We, not I, not you, we. See, in, in the book of Hebrews, the writer was helping this community of faith to have a firm basis for their hope because Jesus finished his work on earth and continues his work in heaven as our high priest. And this letter is pleading with the community to remember the fact that we now have access to God's presence forever and that that fact gives us a firmness for our hope. I want you to think about that. For those new Christians at that time, this was a new idea. This was mind blowing. And they needed the reminder. They needed this letter to help them hold fast to the faith that they proclaimed. They also needed the reminder because they were under persecution. They had lost possessions. They'd been imprisoned in lots of other hardships, which was causing their faith to wane. So now, how does this translate to us today? Here at Fellowship, you'll hear us say all the time that we are not meant to do life alone, that we're, not meant, to, we're meant to do life in circles and not rows. And those are cute little quips that we say, but they are profound and so very true in their essence. Sometimes, friends, we need people in our lives to come around us and carry faith for us. In the seasons when doubt reigns supreme, when we've been hurt in relationships, when sin is running rampant, when the pain just seems too deep, in the seasons when we think we want to be alone, that's actually when we need our family of faith the most. We need people around us who can help us to remember we need people around us who have seen the glory of God on display in our lives and can remind us of the miracle work that God has done in the past to help strengthen our faith. And we need people to sit with us in the present so that we don't miss the right now blessings that God is doing moment by moment. Some of my favorite people um, in our church, I know we're not supposed to have favorites because we're pastors. Yeah, I know, I know that. Some of my favorite people though are those who help us in one way or another execute our mission of our church, which is to make disciples. These are everyone from the moms leaders who mentor moms in different stages of parenting or, or the leaders who lead sixth grade girls life groups with preteens and their doubts to, to, our life, to our group leaders who are walking with people as they mourn life or celebrate life, to our chaplains, to everyone in between. These leaders help carry faith within our family of faith. And it can never be underestimated how important it is that we have people around us who do this for us on a regular basis. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you actually fulfill the law of Christ. We need each other, friends. Because when the world falls apart and the hard stuff sets in, sometimes there aren't words that can be said, but there is faith that can be carried. There is the gospel that can be returned to. The reminder that Christ's work as perpetual high priest provides us with a hope that we will receive the divine blessings simply from being in God's presence. And sometimes that reminder from people who love us and know us, that reminder alone is enough. In uh, summer of 1996, and elect electric power outages twice hit the Western United States when high demand and unfortunate accidents combined to trigger massive outages and blackouts. The first failure affected 2 million customers in 14 states, and the second blackout affected 4 million homes in 10 states. And one spokesman for the power industry said, under no circumstances should this, you know, this blackout be happening, let alone twice in one summer, but it happened. 
and customers wondered if they could trust their power suppliers when they could not provide uninterrupted service. Friends, Jesus provides uninterrupted access to God's presence for his children. We will never have an outage of divine power. His presence before God fills us with hope, help, encouragement, and stamina for along the way. Christ's presence before God is the anchor for our soul. This is our blessed assurance. If you're listening to me today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I encourage you to reach out to us. We have people who would love to talk to you about what it could look like for you to step into a life of blessed assurance with Jesus. The old hymns chorus says, this is my story, this is my song, praising my savior all the day long. How do we get to the place of praising our savior all the day long? By holding tight to an unshakable love, finding Christ in the mundane spaces and doing it surrounded by the community of faith. Will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you that in the midst of so many things that are uncertain and shakable in our world today, God, we can trust you. We can find assurance, a blessed, holy assurance that Jesus is on the throne. God, that you are reigning supreme and that you are in control. God, would you help us in those areas where we need to surrender our lives those areas of our lives that we just want to cling to because we think we can do it better. Would you help us now? Would you pour out your spirit on everyone under the sound of my voice? And would you do it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus? Amen. God bless you, fellowship. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries too high it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see our God Oh, age to age He stands And time is in His hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end Oh, the Godhead Three
is our God. Oh, my heart will sing how great is our God. That was a word from Pastor Angela today. Um, we love her so much. She's uh, dear to us. And um, we just trust that God had something to say to you through what she spoke today. And at Fellowship, we're all about response. We're not about passively receiving the word of God, but responding to it. Babe, what are some ways that we can respond uh, to what Angela brought yeah, today? So we ask two questions every week. Who are you doing life with and where are you serving? And so if you want to volunteer here at Fellowship, you can go to madeforfellowship.com slash volunteer. And we have lots of opportunities. That's right. um, and then we also have connect groups. And if, and if you are someone who wants to go deeper in community this summer, a connect group is a really, really great way um, to get involved and, That's right. and to just be in community with other people. And you can go online to sign up for those as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you might find yourself in this season if you're, you know, if you're in college, if you're maybe post-college, if you're trying to just go deeper and understand God's call on your life and might be wondering if that might be in the church, we are so excited to say that fall intern applications are open. Yes. We have internships here. We have incredible leaders that uh, will, will invite you into their ministry space. And um, it'll be a time of equipping and a time of learning and a time of just doing ministry and doing life with us. So if you're interested in that, go to madeforfellowship.com slash intern. Internships. We can't wait uh, just to invite you into the life of our church. Isn't our church just so generous? So generous. Yeah, so generous. Uh, you have been faithful to give throughout this season. And we just want to take a moment to thank you for your generosity and for your financial giving, uh, for your tithes. And at Fellowship, we believe uh, that our giving is an expression of our relationship with God. And it's an act of worship in saying that we trust you, God, as our provider. So we want to take a moment to thank you and also mm -hmm. invite you to continue to give and as you give to fellowship, you're giving through fellowship uh, just to the kingdom work that is happening in our communities. So thank you and we invite you to give. And we want you to know that we are here for you. So if you need anything, we have pastors on call all the time. They can pray for you, counsel you. Um, yeah, so uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. We're always here for you. And we just want you to know that we want you to stay connected. Just a reminder, next week, if you're in the region, in-person services, Monrovia High School, we can't wait. And then just stay connected to us through social media. So much of what's happening in the life of our church, we put out on social media. And that's just a great way to stay engaged with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and right now, um, it's been so good to be with you. And we just pray a blessing over your life, over your family's life. And we pray that you feel God's presence uh, this week. Absolutely. We love you, Fellowship family.